Amen. So keep your place there in Daniel. We're going to be in the book of Daniel pretty much exclusively um, throughout the sermon this morning. So Daniel um, is my favorite Bible character, um, not just because it's my middle name, but because uh, I just, uh, for many different reasons, I just really like um, Daniel. Um, he's a great character in the Bible. He's a great example for us um, in the Bible. We're going to talk about a little bit um, uh, about one of those types of examples of Daniel um, this morning and how he, um, he shows us, you know, how we should be prosecuting our Christian lives. Um, but we're going to look at Daniel chapter 5 in detail, the story of this handwriting on the wall um, to Belshazzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, um, the um, emperor or the, the king of uh, Babylon. The title of the, the title of the sermon this morning is Daniel and the New World Order. Daniel and the New World Order. So the New World Order, or the World Order, you know, I mean, uh, we're all, you know, to one degree or another conspiracy theorists um, in this church, but the New World Order, that term, um, is a common term that is used um, today, um, talking about the World Order. So um, what does it mean? What is uh, a New World Order, or what is the World Order? What is the definition of? mean? What, what are people talking about when they say, oh, the new world order is coming, or he's pushing for a new world order? What, what does that mean? So I'm going to show you, um, first of all, let's look at Wikipedia, which um, we know is not a great source of information, but Wikipedia, what does it say that the new world order is? Let me just read you the definition of the new world order from um, Wikipedia, then I'll tell you what the new world order or world order actually is, and then we'll look at Daniel and the New World Order, all right? Look at, um, in Wikipedia, not look at Wikipedia, hopefully you don't have Wikipedia on your phone right now. Wikipedia um, terms or def defines the New World Order as this, quote, it says the term New World Order refers to a new period of history evidencing dramatic change in world political thought and the balance of power in international relations. So, first of all, um, I agree with half of that definition, but this idea that it's a dramatic change in world political thought, that's actually a New World Order teaching right there. <laughs> is, is so, the, the Wikipedia definition of the New World Order, it, it kind of has some globalist language in there, you know, showing you that, oh, there's going to be a, there needs to be a dramatic change in political thought in the world. That's what the globalists are teaching today, is that everybody kind of needs to rethink how they look at things. They need to rethink how they look at philosophies, how they look at um, politics, all these different things. So the Bible says, you know, the Bible's nothing new. We know this, right? The Bible says this is why we're, we're a fundamentalist Baptist church. Why? Because we stick to the fundament. We're not, I'm not up here preaching new stuff to you every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday evening. I'm not preaching anything new. We're teaching what? We're teaching the fundamentals, meaning what the Bible already says. You know, in Ecclesiastes, it says that there is no new thing under the sun. So that's what people are trying to teach today, though. They're trying to teach that there is some new thing. That's what people are trying to teach, you know, all these different weird philosophies that you see today. And I don't care. It's just going to keep getting weirder and weirder. But they're saying, oh, no, 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 no. We're more progressive now. We're more enlightened now than we ever have been in the past. So they're teaching all these new things because, well, why weren't these new things taught before? The reality is, these new thing, these, they're not new things. They've always been taught before. But, you know, we need to get back to the fundamentals of the truth, the fundamentals of the Bible. So, this is a false definition right here, talking about, it's just trying to get you to, you know, getting people to try to accept, getting people to accept this idea that there needs to be a new idea, a new political thought process, so people can come together in this globalist, you know, cabal. Right? So half of the definition is literally a globalist definition. Half the definition of Wikipedia, I mean, it's irony, right, that, that Wikipedia would define a new, the, the term New World Order to try to get you to accept a New World Order. But a World Order, or the New World Order, the actual definition is simple, right? The Bible, the Bible documents many New World Orders, and that's what we're going to look at this morning, but the new world order is simply a change in the balance of power in the world. That's it. That's all it is. It's not a complicated thing. It's simply a change in who is in charge, a change in, in power structure. Well, you know, in the, the balance of power in international relations, 
Wikipedia got it half right, but then half the definition they're trying to actually get you to accept new thought, new political ideas, right? When there is no new thing. All the, all the wicked things that are being taught today have been taught before, and it's nothing new at all. So we're going to look at Daniel and the New World Order. All right, so a new world order, if I say to you that there's a new world order coming, what that means is that the balance of power in the world is changing or is about to change or is shifting. And we're going to talk about that, you know, this morning at the later, latter half of the sermon on how that will affect us if the balance of power does shift in the world, just like it is um, shifting in Daniel's world here. So we're going to look at Daniel, how he handles it, and then we'll look at how we should handle it. Very simple. Look at Daniel chapter 5 and verse number 1. We're looking at Daniel and the New World Order. We're looking at Daniel, this, this great example of a Christian in the Old Testament. Let's look at how he handles, you know, change. How he handles, you know, a global change in power structure. Look at verse number 1. So we see this famous story that I don't even know if I've really preached this story before, but it's a great story, a great example in the Bible of a shift in world order. Belshazzar, the king, made a feast to a thousand of his lords. This is the son of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian empire that has taken the nation of Judah, the lower kingdom of Judah, into captivity. Belshazzar, while he tastes the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. So here there, I mean, right there, I, that kind of just makes me nervous just reading that, that statement right there. So he takes, of course, the Babylonian Empire destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. We're talking about Solomon's temple, the first temple. He took the vessels out of the temple, destroyed the temple, and now Belshazzar, you know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son is having a party with all his buddies and all his princes, and he's like, hey, let's get the vessels from that temple that we destroyed, and let's use them for our, our party, right? Look at verse number three. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives, his concubines drank in them. Now it gets even worse. So they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, <coughs> excuse me, and of brass, of iron, of wood, and stone. So, I mean, right away, you can tell, like, hey, this isn't going to go well. <laughs> I mean, you know, this party is not going to end well, right? This king is going, and he's just blaspheming God. He's taking the things of God and just, you know, I mean, go out and look at somebody that, that, that touched something that was, I mean, look at... Um, Look at the guy that, that uh, his name, I'm, I'm not good at bringing up names. I forgot one of my friend's names today in the announcements. But look at um, the guy that touched the ark and who was just killed. You know, Uzzah, thank you. And, and he was just killed. Why? Because he touched a holy thing and it wasn't for him to touch the holy thing. And they weren't doing things the right way and he wasn't supposed to put his hands on the holy things. And this guy has literally taken the, the vessels out of the temple of God and is using them for a party for, with all his friends and all his princes. Look at verse number five. In the same hour came forth fingers of a hand's man. So God responds to this immediately and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote against one another. So right away, he sees this writing on this wall after he's having this, during this party where he's, you know, blaspheming God, basically, and he becomes very afraid. He becomes, his countenance changed. He's not having fun anymore. His knees are, are shaking. He's afraid for himself. Look at verse number eight. Then came, then came all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing. So he goes and he gets, you know, very similar to his father. He goes and he gets all the wise men and the magicians, and they try to figure this out. And, of course, they can't because they're a bunch of charlatans and, and uh, tricksters. Then was King Be Bel Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him and his lords were astonished. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. So the, the queen's about to give him some pretty wise advice here. And she says, There's a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of thy father light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him, 
whom King Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, thy, thy king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. So it's interesting in verse number 11 here, the wife comes in and kind of gives this advice to him, but she's clearly not saved. She's clearly not somebody that believes in the one true God. All she knows and all Belshazzar knows is that all she knows is that there was this, he was the one that was able to figure out the truth for your dad. She's like, you know, he must have had the power of the gods in him. When she, you know, she doesn't realize that it was the one true God and he was the one that only, he was the only one that had um, a god because all these gods of wood and idol or wood and stone, you know, they're not gods, the Bible teaches. So Daniel was the only one that was believing on the one true God. You know, she just, all she knows is that he was able to give the right answers. Look at verse 12. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding interpretation of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and let him show the interpretation. Then was Daniel brought in before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel? which art the children of the, art of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king thy father brought out of Jewry. I have even heard of thee that the spirit of the gods is in thee, see, they don't understand, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing, make known unto me the interpretation thereof, that they cannot show the interpretation of the thing. And then he says to him, he says, I've heard of thee, that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now, if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed in scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. So he tells him the same thing that he told all the magicians. He's like, I'll make you rich. I'll make you this powerful ruler in the kingdom. And, um, you know, what does Daniel think about that? Then Daniel answered and said, let thy gifts be to thyself. He's like, keep your gold. <laughs> and give thy rewards to another. He's like, give all the stuff. He's like, I don't care about the stuff. He's like, give all the gold to somebody else. He's like, but I'll interpret it for you. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and the majesty and glory and honor. And now Daniel's kind of starting to tell him the answer here. He's starting to tell him what the problem is and why the writing came in the first place, in verse 18 and verse 19, and look at verse 19. It says, and for the majesty that he gave him, talking about Nebuchadnezzar, he's literally talking about this kid's dad here. And this kid, it's interesting because Belshazzar, this new king, he knows the story of what happened to his father. You know, he, he says it here. I mean, he says that he knew what, you know, God, or who he thinks is the gods, did to his dad. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him, whom he would, and whom he would slew, and whom he would keep alive, and whom he would set up, and whom he would put down. So the Bible here is saying, it's interesting in verse number 19, and this is really a context that you need to get about this chapter in Daniel chapter 5 and how that differs from what we're seeing today and how that differs from what we're going to see um, and, and just like what, it, what we're going to see in the end times, okay? So look at verse 19 where he's talking about Nebuchadnezzar and he's talking about the powers that he had. And it's talking about who gave him the powers. But it says here, it says, for the majesty that he gave him. So God gave Nebuchadnezzar this, what? He gave him all people, nations, and languages, and they trembled and feared before him. So what you need to understand about this Babylonian empire and about some empires that we're going to talk about um, later in the sermon is that this was a world empire. This was the power in the world here. They ruled, I mean, the Bible is literally saying that Nebuchadnezzar had rule over all people, nations, and languages. And they all trembled and feared before him. So Daniel is just saying, stating the fact of what Nebuchadnezzar had and who gave it to him. So who gave it to him? God gave it to him. He was the one power in the world. We don't have this today. There is no nation that has the, there's the complete control over the entire world. This does not exist today. Keep that in mind. That will be important as we look at the later um, part of the sermon. More on that. Verse 20. 
But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men and his heart was made like the beasts and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like the oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the most high God ruled in the kingdom of men and that he, meaning the, whole, the, the most high God, appointeth over it whomsoever he will. So God humbled. Nebuchadnezzar got prideful. God caused him to lose his mind, caused him to you know, turn into, have the mind of a beast. He's walking around with the animals, eating grass. Like, I mean, he, he, he was sent into madness by God. Why? So God could humble him. Daniel is telling Belshazzar this. Daniel is telling Belshazzar that the reason God did this to your father is because he got prideful and he forgot that God, God appointeth over it whomsoever he will. God rises up kings and God brings down kings. You are only ruling because God is allowing it, buddy. That's what Daniel is telling Belshazzar. Look at verse 22. And thou his son, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart, though now thou knewest all this. He says to him, now you're prideful even though, even though you know what happened to your dad. He hasn't even interpreted any writing on the wall yet. He's just saying, this is why this hand appeared and wrote this down. Now, I mean, if you're Belshazzar and you're listening to this, do you really even want to hear the interpretation at this point? I mean, you're kind of like, Daniel's kind of sitting him down in his chair saying, you're doing worse than your dad did, and this is what happened to your dad. Because you knew, you knew why, what happened to your dad and why it happened. He says, you knew, thou knewest all this, and then you're doing the same thing. Look at verse 22, or verse 23. But has lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. He didn't say the God of gold. And they have brought the vessels of his house, and have brought, they have brought the vessels of his house before thee. And thou and thy lords, thy wives, thy concubines, have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone. And then look what he says. Which seeth not, nor hear, nor know. This is the same thing that Habakkuk talks about, 1 Corinthians talks about, they, they were carried away unto dumb idols. What he's saying is, you have taken the, the Lord of Heaven's holy thing, and then you have brought them, and you, have, you are blaspheming the Lord of Heaven by you know, defiling the holy things, and then you're praising these gods that know nothing. That they're dumb idols. What Daniel is saying is, there's no gods. They're wood, they're stone, they're gold, they're silver. That's all they are. That's why the Bible says dumb idols. Why? Because dumb idols, dumb idols are, what is, it doesn't mean dumb like stupid idiot. It means dumb like they say nothing. They have no mind. They're not real. A rock is dumb in the sense that it can't reveal anything to me. It's silent. This is like, you know, deism from last week, it turns God into, and it makes God dumb. It makes God to where he can't reveal anything to us, where there is no word of God. There is no revelation. There is no uh, prayer. There is no intervention. It makes God a, a dumb God. That's what deism does. By just equating God with the creation, it makes God a dumb God. We don't have a dumb God. We have the Lord of heaven, is what Daniel is saying. Again, does he want to hear the writing, what the writing on the wall says at this point? What a great rebuke this is. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, he's saying, <laughs> again, right? It's, it's, again, you've done all these things to the God that gives you your next breath. And whose are all thy ways thou hast not glorified. Then was part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written, and this thing that was written, mine, mine, tico, a partian, this is the interpretation of the thing. Mine, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. He says, you're done being king. When? Now. 27, Tico, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. 
Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel. At least, I mean, at least he made good on his, his, uh, his promise here. They clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Just what he promised. And that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom about threescore and two years old. So what do we see? We see that the world order changed here. This is what Daniel is declaring to Belshazzar. He's like, the world order is about to change now. You are about to be overthrown, and not, not by some Babylonian king, not by your brother. Like, a literal new empire is coming in to overthrow the Babylonians. In this case, you know, it was, it was one kingdom, like, going to war and just overtaking another kingdom. This is the, the change, even secular history documents this, the change of the Babylonian Empire being overtaken by the Persian Empire. Now turn to Daniel chapter 2. So in this case, in this case, the New World Order was ushered in, um, you know, very quickly. You know, in one day, the Bible says here, it was ushered in, it was ushered in through war, through violence in this case. Literally, the king was killed here in Daniel chapter 5. Okay, and that's what Daniel literally was telling Belshazzar. Because God raises up and God takes down. Look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, we're going back now. We're going back to Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel chapter 2, you know, it is this story of Daniel interpreting this dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. And this dream that Nebuchadnezzar has is, I'm not going to get into every detail about this story, but this dream that Nebuchadnezzar has about this statue is literally a dream talking about new world orders. It's talking about just the, the shift of world power, global power, global kingdoms. Again, something we do not have today. All right, look at Daniel chapter 2, look at verse 31. So the king, he, he, he sees this, this, he has this dream of this image. What we mean by an image is a statue. So when the Antichrist is going to set up an image in the temple, the abomination of desolation, you know, we assume that it's going to be some sort of statue of himself or something similar. Okay, look at verse 31. It says, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness, this is Daniel um, telling Nebuchadnezzar what this means, okay? This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. And the image's head was of fine gold, and his breasts, his arms of silver, his belly, and his thighs of brass. His legs of iron, his feet part iron and part clay. Thou sawest till a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken to pieces together, and came like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. I mean, if you, if last Sunday morning sermon was a prerequisite to this, by the way. All right, you're already pr hopefully seeing it. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. So remember, you know, um, Nebuchadnezzar said to his magicians, you have to tell me the dream and then, you know, um, what it means, right? Thou, O king, art king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And whoso wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven that he had given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all, this, thou art this head of gold. So we got this image. We got this image, and it's got all these different parts made of different things. Now Daniel is going through, and he's telling you know, Nebuchadnezzar, what each part of, you know, different materials that this image is made of, this statue, means. And so he starts with the head of gold, and he says, you, your kingdom, is the head of gold. So it's not hard for us to understand, you know, really what this means, especially as we can look back. Look, if we were in Daniel's time, we would not know, you know, other than the head of gold, we would not really see forward you know, what these other kingdoms, these, these global empires were. But now we can easily look back and see what these global empires are on this statue. Look at this. It says, After thee shall rise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. So 
In verse 39, he talks about the next two empires. Okay, so he says, you know, we know, so even Daniel would know that, you know, the next kingdom after would be this Medo-Persian empire. And he says it's not as great. It's not as great as your empire. And it makes sense because the Medo-Persian empire only lasted about 200 years. It was not a very long, you know, empire, but it was a global empire lasted about 200 years. So you got the Babylonian empire is the head of gold. The next empire is that Medo-Persian empire. And then this third kingdom of brass is now we can see this by looking back through history is the Greek empire that took over the Medo-Persian empire. And this is about, you know, if you want to look at timelines here, you look at the Babylonian empire starting out um, with the uh, captivity of, I mean, obviously the Babylonian empire went back several hundred years before that, but the Babylonian empire ends right around that 550 um, BC point, And then the Greek empire starts right after the Medo-Persian Empire right at that 330 BC. And basically this is Alexander the Great. And if you ever read about Alexander the Great, he conquered, he conquered the known world. You know, and then he, he was pretty much killed right after. But he went all the way up to about 80 BC, you know, somewhere around there. I mean, and it varies depending on who um, you read, what historians you look at. But basically, from 330 BC almost to the birth of Christ, you have this Grecian, this Hellenistic, they call it, the Hellenistic Empire of Alexander the Great ruling in Greece. And, you know, then there's all the treachery, and that's usually how it, you know, the, the great leader dies, and then the treachery begins, and, and the thing falls apart, right? Well, right after um, the, go to verse 40, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces as brute. So now we have this strong of iron empire. Well, what's the next global empire that came up right after the Grecian Empire during the time of Christ? And that was, of course, the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire then ruled um, the known world at that point. So the Roman Empire is this fourth empire of iron. Like I said, we know this looking back throughout history of these global empires. This statue is um, representing. So the Roman Empire lasted a long time. I mean, the Roman Empire lasted, you know, up to, I mean, if you measure just the entire Roman Empire, not just the Roman Republic, it went all the way up to like 600, 600 some um, AD, I guess. Um, so it, it lasted, you know, several hundred years. So it wasn't a short empire like the Persian Empire, and it lasted much longer than even Alexander the Great's uh, empire. So the Roman Empire um, was a very long lasting, very powerful empire. Now we see this future empire though. We see this future empire. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about just new world order, new world order, new world order. We're talking about like when I say world order, I mean world dominating empires. And that's what this statue represents. Okay, so world dominating empires. Look at verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, and there shall be in it of the strength of clay of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. So now we have this, this mixed empire. You know, it's got, you know, it's got, it's the feet, it's the ten toes, right, of this statue. And as the toes of the feet were part iron, part clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. So, so much for, you know, diversity being strength. <laughs> Right there. I mean, the Bible is like literally proving against, you know, diversity being strength. It's, it's much, I mean, a kingdom is stronger if it is unified. Same as a church, by the way. I mean, if we're like this, and this, we're not talking about race. Race is fake. It's made up. Okay? We're talking about, you know, a church. I mean, the Bible in the New Testament is talking about, you know, a church should not be divided. We should not have, you know, we should not, we are, here's what we're not looking for here. We're not looking for diverse cultures here. What does that mean? Does that mean, oh, I can't be from India and come to church here? Or I can't be from, you know, North Dakota and come to church here? I can't be from, you know, uh, Midtown LA or whatever and come to church here? That's not what this means. What this means is it doesn't matter where you're from. Our culture is here. Our culture is the Bible. I have friends that grew up in LA and I grew up in the middle of nowhere in the Midwest. And we are we have more, com more in common than any friends I've ever had. We are, we are more in, in line with everything in our lives because our culture is the Bible. 
Our culture is the same. Diversity is not strength. It's a lie. It's a globalist lie. And you can see that that is what this last empire is going to be. It's going to be this mixed up empire. It's going to be diverse. It's going to be have all these different things. But that means what? It's not going to be strong. It's going to be partly broken, partly strong. You know, it'll be a little strong over here, partly broken. Because it's talking about clay mixed with iron. I mean, hello? You mix iron with, what is it, zinc? And you get steel. But you mix, I mean, go in and start a factory, start a building materials factory, and you're going to say, we're going to make this new material. It's clay and iron put together. And we're going to build buildings out of it. And you're going to go broke, and all the buildings are going to fall down. It's not going to be strong. It's like talking about mixing metal with dirt. This is, I mean, comparing the Roman Empire, which was an empire of iron, it's, it's talking about the strength that they had to this yeah, there's some strength there, but it's mixed with dirt and weakness. It's like putting straw in concrete, right? I mean, it doesn't, it's cheaper because you have to use less concrete, but it, it doesn't increase the strength, all right? You got to use steel. You got to use rebar. Look at verse 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. They shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. I mean, they've, been, they've even done studies like this. I mean, the, the people will not mingle together. People that are diverse, it, it, it's, it's, you know, neighborhoods used to know each other and everybody would know each other and everybody would be friendly in neighborhoods. But the more diverse neighborhoods got, the less people trust each other. It's just, a, I mean, that's just psychology. That's just a study that anybody will tell you. But, you know, that's not supposed to be the case here. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what color you are. Our culture is the Bible. And that, you know what that, that does? That makes us unified, and that makes us strong. The opposite of what's happening here. Look at verse 44. In the days of these kings, now these are the, I'm not going to get into this. I don't really have time to preach on this. This isn't really a Clues and Milestones series. But these are the ten kings in Revelation chapter 17. These are the ten kings that make up this, this world government that the Antichrist is going to lead. It says in the days of these kings, now we see something different here. So we got this last empire that's going to be these ten toes, you know, partly strong, partly not. It's diverse, mixed with clay. In the days of these kings, meaning the kings of these toes, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Well, what happens right after the, the Antichrist kingdom? We have the wrath of God, and then what happens right after the wrath of God? The wrath of God, Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom. That's what we're talking about here. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. What was Jesus doing with the rod of iron? <laughs> He's breaking in pieces. He's breaking, I mean, how many times did you see that in the sermon last Sunday morning where Jesus is he's using the rod of iron to break in pieces people that are against him? To make sure that Jesus' kingdom is truly free and does have that true biblical freedom that, you know, God wants us to have. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and shall stand, I mean, when will Jesus' you know, kingdom end? It's going to go beyond the millennial reign. Jesus will always rule. For as much as thou sawest that that stone was cut out of the mountain, who's the stone? Jesus Christ is this stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands. And that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof, sure. So basically what this is proving is that when Jesus comes back to rule and reign, it's just going to basically this statue, the image is this, this statue at the end. Not only does he break in pieces the toes, it just, it just shreds the whole statue. Jesus is coming back to rule and reign, and he's going to show how to do it. He's going to shred all these other men, men's philosophies and all these other ways that these global empires came to power and fell from power, and he's going to show us how to do it correctly. He's going to show us how to rule and reign in a just way, in a perfect way, which he's been trying to tell us from the Bible, but no one listened. All right? All that to say this, though. All that to say this. These are major world order changes in this statue. In this statue, from the head of gold down to the toes, with all these different empires, these are new world orders. You say, what's a new world order? 
this statue is just new world order after new world order after new world order after new world order. So what's the point of all this? Why bring this up this morning? I got three points to apply this to us this morning. To apply Daniel's life, Daniel's interpretation of this statue, the things that Daniel has seen to our lives. The first point is this. World orders change. They change. I mean, how many, we, what do we see? Four or five world orders change here? Daniel in his life saw three, or lived under three different world orders. There's a very famous uh, speech by George H.W. Bush, you know, the, the, the older Bush from September 11th. I'm sure if you, you've ever, you know, seen any document, documentaries on 9-11 or anything like that, I'm sure that this clip was used. But, you know, and I think it was used after the tribulation, actually. But there was a September 11th speech in 1990 where the George Bush Sr., who was the president at the time, says that a new world order, he uses this word, he's like, we're going to have a new world order. He says, quote, where diverse nations are drawn together in a common cause. That's a quote right from um, George H.W. Bush. And right away, I mean, you think about 1990, what happened in 1990. Well, it was September 11th, 1990, which is interesting. But he says that there's, there's coming a new world order. And what he was talking about was, you know, he was going to, you know, he quotes again in the speech. He says, to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind, peace, security, freedom, and the rule of law. So he's basically saying they're seeing the fall of the Soviet Union. There was this unique thing that happened in 1990. Of course, the Soviet Union officially fell in 1991. But in 1990, the United States was getting ready to go to war in Iraq, in the Middle East, for the first time. This was um, Desert Storm. Most of you maybe aren't old enough to remember this. But in Desert Storm, we went to you know, save the Kuwaitis from you know, um, Saddam Hussein. And there was this, this narrative put out that Saddam Hussein was was creating these weapons of mass destruction. This is when it all started in 1990. The Soviet Union actually got on board with us to do that intervention. This is why George W. Bush, or George H. W. Bush stood up and said, there's a new world order coming, meaning we are going to lead this coalition into the Middle East. We're going to lead this. He's saying, like, the Soviet Union is no longer against us. They are with us. We now have this carte blanche ability to do whatever we want in this part of the world. Okay, and then he says later in the speech, of course, he says, we're going to achieve peace, security, freedom. That's what we're going to achieve. All right, and of course, then the Soviet Union fell a year later, so that just made it even, it, it just gave the United States more operating um, freedom, so to speak, to do whatever we want. Now this, the other competing world power, you know, kind of fell off the map and it became the Russian Federation at that point. But the new world order that George H.W. Bush was talking about is now we, he wasn't talking about now we're a global government. He was saying we have more power as the United States to achieve our goals basically unilaterally. There's people, there's not people that are opposing us. That's what he meant. So that's what he meant by a new world order. He was talking about a shift in power, not we're suddenly a global empire. And we are, to a degree, a global empire. I, I agree that, uh, with that, but um, not one that rules all mankind at this point. Of course, 1991, the USSR falls. And then the US, the United States, had this power. We had this power to bring this promise that George H.W. Bush told the American people that we were going to bring, what? Peace, security, and freedom. What did we do, though? What did we achieve? You know, there's some, there's some memes out there uh, on, the, on the internet, and some of the, there, there's, some, there's some memes out there, uh, you know, addressing this issue. You know, there's like, I'm going to read you a couple of them, and I have to kind of censor one of them. But there's one that shows a bunch of Marines kicking in doors, and it says, you know, the meme, the quote in the meme says, you know, they're kicking in doors in Iraq or some, some Middle Eastern city, some like mud hut somewhere. And the quote says, excuse me, sir, do you have a moment to talk about freedom? <laughs> another one, one of my favorite ones, and I can't say the whole thing, 
But one of my favorite ones is like, it's like a B-2 bomber just like dumping bombs. Like you can just see the bombs coming out and, it's, and it says, we're going to free the blank out of you. <laughs> it's just like, here, we're bringing you freedom by bombing you, basically. But the point I'm trying to get at is this promise that the U.S. gave in this, when this shift of power happened in the, in the early 1990s, this promise, it, we did not succeed at this is all I'm trying to say. You know, it's like, it's, it's the definition of, it's the definition of, you know, the men, you know, the men in the Bible, you know, the fathers are supposed to rule their home. The fathers are supposed to rule their children. The father is supposed to provide for his home in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 8. Ephesians chapter 6, you know, uh, verse, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 1, I think, says, you know, you know, children obey your fathers, you know, but then in verse 4 it says, fathers provoke not your children to wrath. So this is a father who would lead his home as a tyrant, who would just go into his home and just like, you're going to do this or I'm just every single thing. You're going to do this or I, I'm going to punish you. You're going to do this or this. Is eventually you're going to provoke the people that you're following to wrath. This is true in your home and it's also true, you know, as, as a country, as a nation. You know, all these things that apply to you individually also apply to families, also apply to churches, also apply to nations. Many things in the Bible can be taken that way. So the U.S. is not succeeding at this, you know, imposing their will on the world. They have not succeeded at this because people are rejecting it. People, we're, we've provoked many people to wrath in the world. We provoke many people to wrath and many people in the world for many different reasons are saying, you know, I don't know how we haven't figured this out. And every single president, you say, oh, those, those Republicans, every single president, and I figured this out when I was in my mid-20s, because I was a diehard Republican when it was in 1990. I was a diehard Republican, like, yeah, you know, whatever. But look, then I started to realize that every single president did exactly the same thing. Every single president, you know, you look at, you know, Obama and all this, oh, we're not going to be in war. He's dropping bombs on weddings and, and killing 50 people to get one guy or whatever. Even if the one guy was bad, you just created 49 enemies. We're provo we provoked the entire world to wrath by this shift in world order that we had. We are not succeeding at this. However, as the Bible tells us, the Antichrist, whoever this person is, I'm talking about the Antichrist, he will. He will succeed at this. He will succeed at leading this coalition that becomes these ten toes, this diverse group of nations with, with, under these ten kings. He will succeed at this. What I'm seeing now is we are not succeeding at this. For the last 20 or 30 years, we've had the power to succeed at this. We have not, though. We have not done it. So the second point I want to make is this. Turn to Daniel chapter 5. What can we as Christians take away from this? So that's just something to, to understand that, you know, the United States had this shift in power given to them and they did not succeed at this promise that they gave the world that we're going to bring peace and security to everybody. Instead, we provoke people to wrath. We've driven them away. It's good to notice that. All right? It's good to notice that. The second thing is this, and this is more for us as Christians. Look at Daniel chapter 5 and verse 21. This is the verse of the week. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses, and they fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men. That was the point of all of this, that Nebuchadnezzar would know who is really in charge, and that he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. This is a good one for pastors, too. This is a good one for me to never forget. As, you know... Who rules this church? Jesus Christ rules this church, and God, you know, promotes, God appointeth over it whomsoever he will. God, go to Psalm chapter 75. As Christians, we need to understand that it is God that allows people to rule. Amen. Psalm 75, look at verse number 6. God lifts up and puts down. As a Christian, we must always remember that. God lifts up and God puts down. Look at Psalm 75, verse number 6. The Bible says this, For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge, and he putteth down one and setteth up 
another. This is great for you individually as a Christian. This is great for the man that goes to work. You know what? Go to work. Work hard, but stay humble. You know, but then nobody will know what I did. No, work hard and stay humble. It doesn't matter if nobody knows what you did. Don't be the guy that goes into the morning safety meetings or the morning whatever and be like, look at all these great things that I did. Because God promotes. Work hard, be humble, learn, stay humble. Learn more, stay humble. This is a hard thing to do. Not many people succeed at this. I can't tell you, I've said this many times, but it is often the most skilled person in their trade, in their profession, whatever it is, that is the most difficult to deal with. You say, why is that? Because they know they're skilled. Because they know they're the best. Because some, you get some guy who's super good at what he does, he knows that that company, that boss, that whoever needs him. So what happens? He gets super prideful. And he's very difficult to deal with. This is the, this is the old guy at work that's just horrible to everybody. They just treats everybody else like they're an idiot. They just yells at everybody all the time. Like, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's such a common thing. You say, why? I can't tell you how many big projects I've been on where there's just been this guy. And it's like, you need him, though, because he knows everything. But he knows it, and he's super prideful, and he's super difficult to deal with. What you have to understand as a Christian is that work hard, learn, be that guy, be that master, be that cunning man, but stay humble because as a Christian, it is God that promotes. And it is God that puts down. I mean, this guy was the, he was the king of Babylon in Daniel chapter 5, and God just put him down. Why? Because he, he was prideful. Nebuchadnezzar, God put him down. Why? Because he was prideful. So it's God that lifts up and puts down. Now, overall in our lives, you say, what does this have to do with the new world order? Because look, Here's what we need to realize, folks. As an individual, realize, take that home with you. Take that to work with you. Take that to your homes, um, ladies with your kids. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a hard thing being a, a housewife and a homeschool mom and all these things. And many times, and you know, I'm sure this is my fault as a husband, and this is your fault as a husband too, that we don't show our wives enough appreciation. And we should show that appreciation, even though we get busy in our lives and, you know, but we need to take time and show that appreciation. But ladies, know this. God lifts up and God puts down. God will lift you up and God will put you down. Yes, a husband should love his wife and should be, you know, we should all be better at this. We should all be better at appreciating our wives. Because, look, they don't get the praise of men like you will. They don't get the praise of men when you're at work and, and people say, good job, way to go, and way to do that. You know, our wives don't get that. We should, we should give that to our wives. Because without our wives staying home and teaching our children the Word of God, like we have no future family. We have no future generation. So we always need to be better at that. I need to be reminded of that from the Word of God. You need to be reminded of that from the Word of God. But ladies, God rises up and God puts down. You can also take that comfort. But what about us when we look at the world, when we just look at the world? You know, you look at all these these elections coming up and all these political, you know, you know, events coming up and all these different people that want to be our political leaders and, and all this stuff. And, and you're going to have, here's what you're going to hear in the next year as we head into an election season. You're probably already hearing it. This is the most important election of our lifetime. That's what you're going to hear. Don't worry about it. I mean, look, we talk about it and we talk about these details and we're very knowledgeable about these things. But don't worry about why, because God lifts up. And if he feels we deserve it, he will help. If not, you know, Biden part two, whatever. I mean, whatever it's going to be. I mean, if we don't deserve it, you know, God won't. Because it, it, God lifts up and God puts down. So you don't have to give yourself an ulcer over these types of things. What's the third point I want to give you, I want to give you to, this morning on, on new world orders, on shifting world orders? The third point is the most important point. Turn to Daniel chapter 1. Turn to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel lived through three different world orders. Think about that for a minute. He was under the, the lower kingdom of Judah. He, then he went under the Babylonian rule. And then he went under the Persian empire. Daniel literally lived under three different world orders in his life. So the question is, what changed for Daniel? 
And that's our answer today. Nothing changed for Daniel. Yes, his world changed around him, but his convictions did not change. Look at Daniel chapter 1. Look at the first major shakeup in Daniel's world order. Look at verse number 3. The Bible says, And the king spake unto Aphanaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish but well-favored, skillful in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had an ability in them to stand in the king's palace, in whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So they're looking for some smart stock here. They're looking for some smart kids to learn their language and to be a, a benefit to this Babylonian kingdom. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, and at the end thereof they might stand before the king. So they didn't even meet King Nebuchadnezzar for three years. They just brought them to the Babylonian kingdom from Judah, and they gave them this diet. They gave them this, this, uh, this meal that they are to eat to sustain themselves. And among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. This is, of course, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the very famous story um, of the fiery furnace. But Daniel purposed in his heart, verse number 8, this is the key, that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel said, no, I'm sticking to my ceremonial meals and what I eat and what I don't eat. It doesn't matter that this new ruler is over me. I'm sticking to what um, I have purposed in my heart. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. What, what does that say in verse number nine? How did he get in favor of the prince of the eunuchs? It says God brought Daniel. See, God lifts up. So Daniel was loyal to God, and God made sure Daniel was lifted up. Perfect example of, this, of Psalm 75 in verse number 9 there. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then he shall make me endanger my head. You shall make me endanger my head to the king. He's like, you're going to get us all killed, is what he's telling Daniel. He's like, because you're going to be all skinny and all frail, and all the other people that didn't, you know, aren't taking your vow as you are, are going to be all healthy and looking good, and the king's going to cut my head off. Then said Daniel to Melsar, when the prince of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, Hanai, Mishael, and Azariah, okay, I'll do it. And he says, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let us give us pulse to eat and water to drink. So, look, he just said, I'm just, I'm sticking to the way I do things. You know, then in the Medo-Persian Empire, they actually tried to kill him again. They try to kill him again. They get together and they try to kill him. But turn to James chapter 4. We'll look at that in just a few minutes. But look at James chapter 4. Look at verse number 10. Just to drive home that God lifts up. The Bible says in James chapter 4 and verse number 10, if what though? If what? And you'll notice one of the great things about Daniel is you'll notice every time, every time that Daniel does one of these great things for a king, he immediately gives all the credit to God. He's like, just give all the stuff away. I don't want some stupid gold chain. Give it to somebody else. He's like, it's God that will give you this answer. It's the one true, it's the Lord of heaven, he says in Daniel chapter 5, that can give you this interpretation. It's not me. He doesn't go take credit for things. But then he ends up being the second in command of the Babylonian Empire. And then literally the Babylonian Empire gets destroyed by the Persian Empire. And he's second in command of the Persian Empire. I mean, who's ever even heard of a story like that? Where an empire comes in, because look, when a company comes in and buys another company, you know, it's always the small company that says, look, we're going to do things, we're not going to change. No, they've come in and bought you, they're going to change everything. They're going to fire half the people, they're going to change everything because they bought you. They came in and bought you, took over you, they are going to tell you how things go. That's exactly how it works when empires come in and take over other empires. Yet this guy was lifted up to basically to run both empires. I mean, basically, Nebuchadnezzar and, you know, the king of, of the Persian Empire, it's not like he's going to let him be king. He's going to keep that title, but he's got this guy running everything. He's like, we're keeping this guy. The Bible says in James 4.10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. 
But the point I'm trying to make on this last point is this. Make your convictions clear in your life. Make your lines bold in your life. Make your lines bold. Draw them biblically. Draw bold biblical lines in your life. And then when these shakeups come, when these shifts in world order come, and the world goes nuts, and things change, and people are, you know, doing things. Look, things are changing now. That's why I'm preaching this sermon. So you're noticing things in the world changing now. The world order is shifting now. It's kind of exciting, if you ask me. Because, I mean, we're living in exciting times, even though the world order is shifting away from the United States. And look, we're practical in this church, and I like talking about practical things, and hey, what does this mean? What does this mean for, you know, prices? What does this mean for, you know, how we're going to be able to support my family this year versus next year, and all these different things, and I love talking about those things. That's why God gives us this detail in the Bible, so at least we can see it coming. We can see the things coming, and look, we know the reasons behind everything. We know the, the direction that things are headed. People without the Bible must be so confused. People without the Bible, they're just like, what in the world? You know, that's what I think, you know, I'm starting to think that Daniel, Daniel 12, 4, when it says, many shall run to and fro, I'm starting to think that maybe that's not so much travel, and it's people like just running around like with their hands in the air, like, what are we going to do? Seriously, I'm starting to think that maybe it means more towards that. Because what did we see? I mean, what did we see with, with COVID? We just saw people running around with their hands in the air. In, in the air. What are we going to do? Everybody's life is just completely upended. But the point, the first point for us is that nothing changes for us. That's the beauty of the Christian life. That's the beauty of what Daniel shows us here as he went through three different empires. He lived in three different world orders. Nothing changed for him. But instead, our goals are the same. Even during COVID, even that mix-up. I mean, that wasn't really a change in world order, but it was definitely a shake-up of the way things did things. But you look at people, their lives are completely upended. Running to and fro. Some kids were out of school for like a year and a half. It's crazy. It's crazy to even think that. Like, nothing really changed for us, though. Church, soul winning. Eh, you know, we kind of adjusted soul winning. We adjusted church there for a while. We thought we were going to get you know, arrested or whatever, so we did some things a little bit different. But church, soul winning, even conferences. <laughs> I mean, we're going to conferences. It's all the same. It's all the same. Everybody else is all mixed up. Everybody else is running to and fro. You know, they're running around like they're crazy. They're all worried about dying. I mean, we're just like, what do you do? They're just hands waving everywhere. You know, look, we should see these shifts, and we should be prepared. We should be prepared for what's happening. We shouldn't just be blind. I mean, that's what Jesus tells us to do in Mark 13 is watch. That's why I tell you these things. He's like, I'm telling you all these different details, all these things that we go through in clues and milestones. Why? So you can watch. So you can be ready. But our goals stay the same. So as we see, you know, that there's, there's going to be this big push, we see a push for globalism today. We see a push for globalism today. It's not the first time, though. This statue in Daniel chapter 2, we're looking at global empires that actually were global empires. So even though there might be part of the world today that's pushing for globalism, it's not the first time that that's happened. It's not the first time that it was actually achieved. I mean, the Antichrist is actually going to achieve it, but even that achievement has been achieved before. The United States tried to achieve it, or is trying to achieve it, look, as the United States and the West is pushing for globalism, I don't think it's going to be the last push that we see. That's, that's all I'm trying to get. That's my, just my opinion on this whole thing. Unless you see, like, clown world succeeding and getting everyone to follow them. But as I said, we're a gazing stock. As I said, there's, there's over 50% of the world that wants nothing to do with what we're selling. The Antichrist, though, is actually going to achieve this. But, you know, the shifting that we see today is significant. It's interesting times. It's all good to be prepared. It's all good to talk about these things. It's all good. It's all necessary. But back to the main point and the last point that I want to get you to understand. If you don't have convictions now, 
and you don't have lines drawn now in your Christian life, look, get your priorities and your convictions now because you will never hold them or keep them or even have them if times get difficult. This is the point of math or of Daniel here, is that he had these convictions and he held them all the way through. World orders change. World orders change. And look, sometimes dramatically in one day. That's not what we're seeing now. We're seeing this slow shift, and maybe this slow shift turns into some dramatic change. I don't know. But you see world orders change dramatically. You see them change subtly. You see shifts of power. You know, we should notice these things. We should adjust accordingly. But ultimately, our convictions, as with Daniel, should be bold lines, and they should not move. Go to Daniel chapter 6 and verse number 13. We'll end it here. They should not move. And guess what, folks? They should not move even when people demand that they move. I mean, what if, what if a government, think about this for a second, what if a government came in, what if there was a shift in the world order and a government came in and said, you can't be a Christian anymore? That's not, that does not mix with our clay and our iron, and that doesn't mix with the diversity that you know, we want to push. What if they said, you can't be a Christian anymore under this new world order that we've now achieved? You can't have a Bible anymore. You can't go to church anymore. If you're caught with a Bible, you're, you're going to be executed. You think this is new? You think this has never happened before? Turn to Daniel chapter 6. In Daniel chapter 6, these are the Persians that come in. And Daniel, what does Daniel do? Daniel has a prayer life. Daniel has a prayer life, and he prays to God three times a day. So these wicked, evil princes of the Persian king, they pass this, they pass this law that says, you can't pray to God anymore. And Daniel's like, I mean, they literally passed the law saying, you can't be a Christian anymore. And what does Daniel do? He just keeps doing what he always did. He kept doing what he did as a Babylonian. He kept doing what he did when he was in Judah. He just prayed to God three times a day. Look at verse 13. It says, Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king. They tricked the king into passing this decree. They say, King, it passed this decree. It'll make you great, and people will worship you. Nor the decree that thou hast signed, but makest his petition three times a day. So what do they do? They throw him in the lion's den, and God, of course, protects Daniel. But the point is, Daniel changed nothing. They passed some law, and Daniel changed nothing. In verse number, look at verse number 17 of Daniel chapter 3, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were also, you know, um, they had to worship this image of, uh, you know, of Nebuchadnezzar, and they're just like, no, we're not going to do that, like, because that's not what we do. <laughs> and, you know, and even, I love the answer of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in, or not Daniel, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because they're going to be thrown into this furnace. Look at verse 17. They're like, if it be so, our God whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. They're like, it's possible God will save us, but they're like, whatever, we're still not worshiping your image. They're like, what did they change? It became illegal to be a Christian. It became illegal to not worship idols. Kind of like what's going to happen in the end times. What did they change? This new world order came in, that it's illegal to be a Christian now, and they're like, well, well, I guess we're going to the furnace. You see why your convictions need to be made strong, and those lines need to be made bold, now when we have no trouble. Amen. Otherwise, there's no chance. There's no chance that you will hold convictions. You're like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start working out when the workout is the hardest. No, you've got you to work up to these things. You have to build the strength of those things. So the point is this, like, world orders shift and they change. I mean, look, folks, this right here is people drawing and holding lines. Look at how thick that book is. It is people that were told, this is nothing new. There is no new thing under the sun. It's not just the story of Daniel in the Bible. It's people that were told, stop baptizing people. Stop preaching the gospel to people. Stop having Bibles. And what happens? It's the martyr's mirror. They were all killed. They were all killed. Many people don't even know that in pre-revolution America, Baptists were persecuted for preaching. 
Baptists were beaten and imprisoned for preaching the gospel in pre-revolution America. But by the Protestants. We're not Protestant. Amen. Never have been. Amen. So the point is, it's been illegal to be a Christian before. World orders change all the time. And sometimes those world orders are very against Christians. But the men in the Bible, the martyrs throughout history, they're all just like, hey, this is my line. That's it. Do your worst. And that's where we need to be. It's a, it, I mean, that's a hard thing to accept. But the story of Daniel, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, our world order shifting, they're changing, and the Christians should not. That's that story of those men. They're great examples for us. They're great examples for us in the Bible. That's why the martyrs are there for us, to see other Christians doing what we one day may have to do. I mean, I hope we're not in the end times. I hope we have more time, and I hope that, you know, uh, you know people don't accept, you know, the, the clowns of clown world and, and all that. And I don't think they're going to, but, you know, I, I've been wrong before. I, I'm sure I'll be wrong again. But it doesn't change anything for us is really the main point of the sermon. World orders change. They shift. And they're shifting now. We're watching them shift now. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.